of that tonight. Well, turn in your Bible, if you would please, to Matthew chapter number 20. So good to see you tonight. Thank you for making the house of God a priority. A lot of folks wouldn't do that tonight, but I'm so glad you did. Can I just say this before we read the text before us? It says a whole lot about you and your walk with the Lord for you being in the house of God tonight. We're so glad you're here. I don't know about you, but I'd rather be here anywhere I know, right here in the house of the Lord. Brother Hill, thank you so much for the wonderful presentation tonight. My, if that didn't touch your heart for the need in Argentina, I doubt anything else will. What a great, great presentation. I have just uh, met and fallen in love with Brother Raleigh Hill. I call him Sir Walter Raleigh Hill. Amen. And I appreciate him being here tonight, his wife Cassie and their children. And I assure you, I believe with all of my heart that fruit will abound to your account as you partner with them to get the gospel to Argentina. I was preaching in Illinois not long ago and met the Orozco family, fell in love with them, and I was so pleased to see uh, that they are going to be here during the conference as well. And the same thing I said about Brother Hill, I'll say for them, I believe with all of my heart, fruit will abound to your account as you partner with them to help get the gospel to Hawaii and even beyond. Did you know, folk? I, and I'm sure you take a lot of kidding, oh, you're going on vacation, going to Hawaii. Let me tell you something about Hawaii. Hawaii is the least evangelized state in the United States of America. You know, there's not a lot of folks standing in line to go to, a lot of folks standing in line to go visit, but when you go there to live and reach the Hawaiian people with the gospel, that's a completely different story. You know the cost of living in Hawaii? A gallon of milk is more than double what you pay for milk. Things like that, people don't ever think when they kid about, oh, you're just going for a vacation. Not a lot of folks standing in line to do what they're getting ready to do. And I'm so thankful that they are because somebody needs to reach Hawaii with the gospel. Amen. Have you found your place in Matthew chapter number 20? If you have, would you please stand? In just a few moments, I'm going to begin reading in verse number 29 of the chapter. Now, as we read these verses of Scripture tonight, I believe it's imperative that each of us remember that at this point, the Lord Jesus is on His way to Calvary to lay down His life and shed His blood for the sins of the entire world. However, before he does so, he illustrates what he longs to do for the world spiritually in the lives of two blind men physically here in the text before us. Matthew chapter 20 and verse 29. The Bible says, And as they departed from Jericho, a great multitude followed him. And behold, two blind men sitting by the wayside, when they heard that Jesus passed by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou Son of David. And the multitude rebuked them, because they should hold their peace. But they cried the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou Son of David. And Jesus stood still and called them and said, What will ye that I shall do unto you? They say unto him, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. So Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes, and immediately their eyes received sight and they followed him. Now, I would encourage you to leave your Bibles open as all few points of the message tonight will be taken not only from these verses of Scripture, but in Revelation chapter 2 that we'll be turning to here in just a few moments as well. I'm going to preach on this thought tonight. If you're going to love them, you're going to have to love him. And when I say them, when I say if you're going to love them, I'm talking about the seven billion plus people of the world. I want to tell you something. If you don't love him the way you ought to love him, the way the Bible teaches us that we ought to love him, you'll never love them. If you love them, you're going to have to love him. Let's bow our heads for a moment of prayer. Father, my heart 
has been blessed, touched, challenged already tonight. I'm so thankful for a man of God that led his church family into gathering once again this side of eternity this Sunday night. Lord, I'm thrilled to be here. And Lord, you know my heart. I want to be a blessing, a help, and an encouragement to Pastor Cox, Mrs. Cox, their children, and this wonderful church family. Father, knit our hearts together for a few moments tonight around the truths of thy word, and we'll give you glory, and we'll give you honor. Lord, I'm nothing without you. Help me, I pray, tonight. Cleanse me of sin and self and fill me with your precious spirit and I'll give you glory for truly thou art worthy. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you for standing. You can be seated. Again, I believe it's vitally important for each of us to remember while considering the portion of Scripture before us that Jesus at this point is on his way to lay his life down on the cruel cross of Calvary. Everything that has happened in the preceding verses of Scripture is pointing to the day when the Lord Jesus would shed every drop of His personal, precious, powerful blood for the sins of the entire world on Golgotha's hill. However, shortly after Jesus and His disciples departed from Jericho, the Word of God reveals that two blind men who were sitting by the wayside having heard that Jesus began passing by, cried out to him and said, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. Initially, the desperation in their cry that we witness in verse 30 eventually would lead to the disgust of the crowd that we witness in verse 31 because there the Bible says the multitude began to rebuke them and admonished them to hold their peace. However, according to the latter portion of the same verse of Scripture, these two blind men refused to be distracted, detoured, or discouraged. I submit to you, the Bible teaches us they were not only passionate in their cry, but they were persistent in their cry because the Bible says that they proceeded to cry the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David, to the point that Jesus stood still, called them, and then proceeded to ask them, What will ye that I shall do unto you? Now let me hasten to remind you this morning, ladies and gentlemen, that Jesus did not ask that question because Jesus did not know the answer. Absolutely not. Jesus asked that question because he wanted to know that they knew the answer. And according to the Bible, they certainly did. Because verse 33 says that they say unto him, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. And then the Word of God goes on to teach us in verse 34 that Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes to the point that immediately their eyes received sight and they followed Him. And again, the truth that I want to encourage you to consider for a few moments tonight from this portion of Scripture is this. What we witness the Lord Jesus doing for these two men physically in the text before us is exactly that that He longs to do for the world spiritually as I stand and as I preach the Word of God tonight. In fact, for just a very few moments, uh, let me call your attention, if I may, to a few sobering truths directly from the text which I trust the Lord will use to drive that point home. First of all, when I look into the latter portion of Matthew chapter 20, I see, number one, a condition that is desperate. In fact, I see two things directly from the text uh, that uh, teach us beyond a shadow of a doubt the condition that these men were in at this point. It was a desperate condition, to say the least. First of all, the Bible teaches us that these men were blind. Now, the Word of God makes that perfectly clear as early as verse 30 of the text before us. They were blind. They could not see what you and I are blessed to see every day of our lives and more times than not take for granted. From all indication, these men were born that way. My, what a desperate condition these men were blind men. They were not only blind, but the Bible teaches us that they were begging as well. 
I say that because other gospel accounts of this same story assures us of that truth. That's why I say their condition was desperate to say the least. Consider the truth of the Word of God. These men were blind. These men were begging men. My, what a desperate condition. And may I say tonight in their desperate condition, we have before us a great illustration of the desperate condition of the world in which you and I live tonight. I believe that what these men were physically then the world this very evening is spiritually tonight. The world is blinded spiritually. They are spiritual beggars continuously searching for satisfaction in the temporal things as opposed to the eternal things of God. Isn't that exactly what the Apostle Paul alluded to as God inspired him to pen 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 3 where the Bible says, But if our gospel be hid, it is him to them that are lost in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ who is the image of God should shine unto them. So yes the first thing that I see here in the latter portion of Matthew chapter 20 is number one a condition a condition that is desperate uh, but I'm glad the story doesn't end by simply revealing a condition that is desperate. I see secondly a compassion that is definite. According to the text before us, others did not care. But Jesus cared. According to the text before us, others were not moved by these men's condition, their dreadful condition, their blind, their begging condition. But while others were not moved, Jesus was moved. According to the Bible, others would have never thought of standing still for these blind, these begging men. Oh, but according to verse 32, Jesus not only stood still, but he went as far as to call them. And then he proceeded to ask them, What will ye that I shall do unto you? And when the men responded to the Lord Jesus, Lord, that our eyes may be open, the Bible says that Jesus had compassion on them and he touched their eyes to the point that he Immediately, immediately, their eyes receive their sight. May I say to you tonight, ladies and gentlemen, these men found hope in Jesus. These men found help in Jesus. And their lives were never the same as a result of Jesus passing by. How many of you know tonight, how many of you can say amen tonight to the fact that it always makes a difference when Jesus passes by. I never read these sto this story, Brother Hill, without remembering the day that I myself made my way to the house of the Lord as a little eight year old boy and heard the glorious gospel message Jesus passed by my way one day when I was spiritually blinded by sin when I was a spiritual beggar searching for things and satisfaction in the temporary things of this world as opposed to the eternal things of God but just as Jesus had compassion on these blind these begging men the Jesus had compassion on me and instead of giving me what I deserved he extended grace he extended mercy and I was saved because Jesus came passing by my way let me say it one more time it always makes a difference when Jesus passes by amen however what I especially wanted to do tonight is call your attention to the fact that we not only see a condition that is desperate, we not only see a compassion that is definite, but uh, number three tonight, we see a crowd that's very discouraging. I don't know about you, Pastor, but I've always found it amazing that there was a crowd that wasn't the least bit concerned about what Jesus could do for these men. The Bible says, when they begin to cry, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou Son of David, the crowd rebuked them and admonished them to hold their peace. Brother, what a lack of concern. Instead of being burdened by these men's desperate condition, 
they were bothered by. Instead of being moved with compassion, the Word of God teaches us the crowd was moved to condition, con, con, uh, contention. When they should have cared, the Bible says that they could not have cared less. Do you know what the Bible teaches us about the crowd here? The crowd was unmoved by their condition. The crowd was untouched by their cry. And ultimately, the crowd was unchanged by their healing. Do you know what the attitude of the crowd was? Let me tell you what the attitude of the crowd was. Hey, I'm not blind. So since I'm not blind, why should I even remotely be concerned with those who are blind? You know what the attitude of the crowd was? Hey, I'm not begging. So as long as I'm not begging, why should I even remotely be concerned about those who are begging? Did you notice the difference, according to the Bible, between Christ's attitude towards these desperate men and the crowd's attitude? Christ cared, but the crowd could not have cared less. Christ stood still, but the crowd didn't stand still. Not for them, they didn't. Christ called them according to verse number 32. But simultaneously, while the Lord Jesus, the King of glory, while Christ was calling them, the crowd was rebuking them. Jesus cared. Jesus loved them. Jesus, according to verse 34, had compassion on them to the point that He touched their eyes and changed their lives forever. But can I ask you tonight? Why is it that the crowd could not have cared less? Can I ask you this tonight? Why doesn't the crowd love them? Jesus did. What about the crowd? Why doesn't the crowd care about what happens to these blind and these begging men? Can I tell you why I believe the Word of God put this story in the Bible and gave us all these different facets of the story? The crowd didn't love them because the crowd didn't love Him. And as I consider the truth of this story tonight, it's sad to say, but nevertheless true. The situation tonight, as far as reaching the world with the gospel, hasn't changed that much at all. I want you to listen to what I'm getting ready to say this evening, church. Are you listening? Say amen. amen. Tonight, as I stand and preach the word of God, there are seven billion, that's right, I said billion with a B, seven billion plus people in the world tonight, and the overwhelming majority of them have never heard the name of Jesus, much less a clear presentation of the glorious gospel of, of the Lord Jesus. What these men were in the text physically, I submit to you the overwhelming majority of the world tonight is spiritually. They are both blind and they are begging. Their situation is desperate to say the least. But why? Can you please tell me why? That people will pay $3,500 for a seat at a ball game tonight. And here we are trying to stir our hearts about the great need to reach the world and they could not care less. Can I tell you why? They don't love them. They don't love the seven billion people of the world because they don't love Him. In fact, let me just make it real, real personal tonight. Since the first Sunday in May of 2014, I've been in a different church every week of my life. That'll continue as long as the Lord wants to use me. But why is it in most independent, fundamental, Bible-believing, temperamental Baptist churches, we are more bothered than we are burdened when it comes to the great need of reaching the world with the gospel? Why is it that in Instead of following our Savior's example in the text and being moved with compassion, we're often moved to contention when it comes to the great need of reaching the world with the gospel. Why is it that there are so many people in our local independent fundamental churches that are unmoved by the world's condition, untouched by the world's cry, and therefore unchanged in their hearts when it comes to reaching the world with the gospel? Could it be tonight? Could it be tonight that 
we really don't love them the way we ought to love them because if we'd be honest we really just don't love him the way we ought to love him now with that in mind I want you to turn with me to Revelation chapter 2 Revelation chapter number 2 I'm afraid that many of us many of us who have been saved by the good grace of God have reached the same point that the church of Ephesus had reached according to Revelation chapter 2 now it's interesting that God begins this letter to the local Bible believing church at Ephesus by commending them notice what God says to the church in verse 2 of the chapter I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them liars and hast borne and hast patience and for my name's sake hast labored and hast not fainted and so yes God begins this personal letter to the church of Ephesus by commending the church God makes it abundantly clear in his letter to the church there had been a time in their past that they had loved them and they had labored to win them. Oh, but slowly, but ever so surely as their love for him began to wane, ultimately their love for them began to wane. And so beginning with verse number four of the church, the letter of commendation turns into a letter of condemnation he commends them in verse 3 but now look at verse 4 he begins to condemn them nevertheless I have somewhat against thee because watch your Bible now thou hast left thy first love remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place except thou repent. And so God makes it abundantly clear in his personal letter to the pastor of the church at Ephesus. He's got a problem with the church. First of all, according to the text, theirs was a personal problem. God said to the church at Ephesus, I have somewhat against thee. Now hear me tonight. God takes it very personal when we lose our burden to reach the world with the gospel. God said, I have somewhat against thee. Theirs was a personal problem. Theirs was a passion problem. God said, here's the problem I have, Wiga. It's not a lack of ministries in the church. It's not a lack of funds in your bank account. It's not even a lack of members on the membership roll. That's not the problem I have with you. God said, here's the problem I have with you. You've left your first love. God didn't say you'd lost your salvation. He said they had left their first love. That is to say the relationship the church at Ephesus once enjoyed with the Lord, that close, personal, intimate relationship that once spurred them on to give regularly, faithfully, systematically, over and above their regular tithes and offerings so that others could hear the gospel. That relationship that had spurred them on to be soul winners, to pass out gospel tracts, to get involved in the outreach and the ministry of the local church, that intimate, close, personal relationship that had spurred them on to love them and labor together to win them because their love for Him had waned. Ultimately, it led to their love for them waning as well. They did not love them the way they should have loved them because they did not love him as they should have loved him. And you know the sad truth about this fact is this. I appreciate the missionary presentations. You heard a great one tonight. That's as good as you'll ever hear. Short, simple, to the point, heart-touching, but I want you to know tonight, because I love you, church, and I, along with your pastor, I'm trusting the Lord with us this 
with all of us together that he'll give us a real missions revival during the missions conference this week. But I'm just going to tell you the truth. All the missionary presentations in the world is not going to change your heart for the need to reach the world with the gospel until we fall in love with Jesus. You can sing, send the light, the blessed gospel light until you can't sing anymore and you lose every ounce of breath in your lungs. But you'll never have a desire to send the light the way we ought to have a desire to send the light until we fall in love with Jesus again. We'll never love them. We'll never love the people of Simpsonville, South Carolina. We'll never love the people of Hawaii. We'll never love the people of Argentina. We'll never love the people of China, Brother Mullinex, like we ought to love the people of China, Argentina, and Hawaii until we fall head over heels in love with Jesus again. We'll never love them until we love Him. Now, I made this statement in the message this morning. I believe it bears repeating. The Bible never reveals a problem without revealing a solution for the problem. And so when God begins to condemn them for leaving their first love, He reveals the solution. The same solution that He reveals to both you and I through the pages of the Word of God today. And These preachers have preached this time and time again. I'm going to borrow their outline. God says, I want you to do three things. Number one, I want you to remember. God says to the church, beginning with verse 5, since you've got a passion problem, since you don't love me with the passion, with the zeal, with the fervor that you used to love me with, let me admonish you to remember. Can I ask you this question before I move on tonight? Can you remember, can I remember a time in my life when I was closer to the Lord than what I am right now. Because if I can, I'm not loving them the way I ought to love them. Because I'm not loving Him the way I ought to love Him. And so maybe tonight, just maybe, we need to take a walk down memory lane. Hey, you remember, oh, I, I remember when God first dealt with my heart about getting completely and thoroughly right with him. I was serving on board the USS Dwight D. Eisenhower in the United States Navy. God had called me to preach the Bible. And I'm honest, while the rest of the fellows went to lunch, I didn't want to go to lunch. I wanted to go to my rack and my birthing and open up my Bible and pull the curtain on my rack and read the Bible. I couldn't get enough of the Bible. All I wanted to do was read the Bible. I thanked God for the Bible. You know what I do? I go to sleep many times holding my Bible Bible at my chest, having read the Bible, I would cry myself to sleep, having read the portions of the Bible. I love the Bible. Do you remember a time when you used to love the Bible like I used to love the Bible? But boy, now we'll just throw it in the back seat of the car, not even pick it up until Sunday school next Sunday morning, if that. You remember? You remember when you used to get excited about the things of God? Do you remember when the preacher used to preach? You'd sit on the edge of your seat hanging on every word he said. You just couldn't get enough of the good sound Bible preaching like you have around here week after week after week. You remember when the missionaries used to come? Man, it used to touch your heart. You might have even made a trip to the altar saying, Lord, if you want me in Argentina, Lord, I'm willing to go to Argentina. But now it's distant. You remember? Do you remember, can you remember a time in your life when you were closer to God than what you are right now? God said, remember. He not only said remember in the text, but of course He said repent. He said in verse 5, remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent. That word repent is an interesting word. It refers to a change of mind that ultimately leads to a change of action. When the church of Ephesus saw the depths of their sin, they were to turn from their sin and fall in love with Jesus all over again. And can I tell you tonight, church, you fall in love with Jesus, you'll have no problem with a pastor leading Bible Baptist Church into doing more to reach the world with the gospel. You fall in love with Jesus, man, you'll start loving the things Jesus loves and you'll want to do your part as you repent everything in your life that would keep you from loving the Lord as you ought to love the Lord. Jesus said remember. Jesus said repent. And then of course Jesus said repeat. 
I say that because verse 5, God instructs the church to do their first works. Which works? Their first works. First works are works that are first in rank and importance. When Jesus commanded the church to do their first works, do you know what he was admonishing them to do? He was admonishing the church to keep the main thing the main thing. And when you read and study this King James Bible, you or I either one will never have to wonder what the main thing should be. But ye, Acts chapter number 1 and verse number 8, shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto where? The uttermost part of the earth. Latter portion of verse 15 of Mark chapter 16. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Where there is a creature, God intends for there to be a preacher. That's the main thing. The main thing is not arguing over the color of the carpet or the paint on the walls. It's not arguing over whether we have benches or seats. It's getting the gospel to a lost and dying world. The main thing is to keep the main thing That's what it means when the Bible says to repeat, to do our first works. Can I ask you tonight one more time before I close? Why is it that we just don't have the burden that we should have to reach the world with the gospel? Why is it that more times than not we're bothered when we should be burdened? when it comes to reaching the world with the gospel, could it be tonight, could it possibly be that we do not love them the way we ought to love them because we really don't love Him the way we ought to love Him? I got something I want to share with you. I keep this on my table everywhere I go. And it's placemats that we make at Macedonia. Churches uses uh, these uh, in missions conferences, missions revivals, things like that. They'll put those placemats at the places that may, they may be what have an international supper or something like that. And they're designed to ever keep people from every continent in the world in front of others in the church. And I know what you're probably thinking. You look at these people, maybe this lady up here in the Far East or the fellow from Africa down here at the bottom or this... Uh, black gentleman down here uh, in the corner uh, that represents the West Indies. And maybe you would ask the question and I, preacher, I, I don't understand. You're, you're, you're encouraging, you're admonishing us to love these people, but we've never met these people. How can we love people that we have never met? Maybe you're wondering tonight, having witnessed uh, the Hills presentation, as they're getting ready to take their family, their beautiful children, and they're getting ready to go to a foreign field that quite frankly is made up of people that's not going to be standing at the airport applauding them when they get off of the plane thanking them for selling their house, selling their land, selling their property so they can come to Argentina and win the Argentine people for the cause of Christ. What, what, what would persuade them? Is there a family down there that the hills just love, that it's so, such a deep love that they would sell everything they had and completely change their entire lifestyle to go to Argentina? Is it... How could they love a people that doesn't look like them, that doesn't dress like them, that lives in a different culture? They don't even know them. How can they love them? Can I tell you, they can love them because they love Him. You see, if the truth be known, they're even though I understand they're going to win them to Jesus, but it's not them that's motivating them to go. Oh yes, they love them and they care for them. But the reason why they love them is because they love Him. They love Jesus. They love the Lord. And when you fall in love with Jesus, can I tell you tonight, you'll have no problem loving the people of Mexico, of the West Indies, of South America, of Australia. You'll love them because you love Him. 
I got something else I want to show you tonight. Now I know what you're thinking. Preacher, I thought you had something special under that coat. This is something special. Oh, not to you. Let me tell you why it's special to me. When I pastored my second church, it was the Calvary Baptist Church of Statesville, North Carolina, where my good friend, Dr. Chris Hazlett, pastors today. My little boy, Joshua, was probably about six years old when we moved there from my first church. I, I left my first church because of uh, sickness. They were sick of me and I was sick of them. So I left the first church and went to pastor the Calvary ba Oh, come on, laugh. I'm kidding, all right? These independent Baptists, they just take, they can't even laugh, you know. And uh, so I left my first church to pastor the Calvary Baptist Church, hung a sign on the church parsonage that said, thanks to Calvary, I don't live here anymore. Amen. So I left there. That'd be a good place to laugh too. So I left there and went to pastor the Calvary Baptist Church in Statesville, North Carolina. Well, my little boy was just at that age to where he had begun throwing a baseball. And as soon as he could pick up a baseball, he fell head over heels in love with baseball. I mean head over heels. So not long after that, me and his mama went to Walmart and bought him this cheap little Rawlings glove. Can I ask you this question? Does it look like he used it much? Most little boys his age at that time, I don't know, some of them carry around a teddy bear, some of them carry around a blanket, not my little boy. My little boy carried around this baseball glove. He'd go to sleep holding this baseball glove. He'd wake up in the morning holding this baseball glove. Every day, Brother Hill, when I came home from the office, my little boy would be standing at the door wearing this very glove, and he'd want me to take him out in the backyard and play baseball with him. I pastored that church seven years, and when the moving van came to help us move our stuff outside of Atlanta, Georgia, where I pastored the last 12 of my 22 years of pastoring, there were two ball spots in our backyard, one at the pitcher's mound and one at home plate. We literally wore the backyard out playing baseball, and Joshua played with this very glove. He loves the glove. Now, my little boy is not so little anymore. He's 24 years of age. He's in the army, and please pray for him. I was sharing with the preacher at lunch today. He's going to be deploying to Afghanistan at the last part of the year. So if you could pray for me and pray for, pray for his mom especially, pray for him, we certainly would appreciate that. But did you know he still loves the glove? He's 24 years old. You want to know what I had to do to get this glove to bring and share with you tonight? He had this glove, Pastor, he had this very glove hanging on his wall. He can't even get his hand in it anymore. But he still loves the glove, so he had it hanging on his wall. And when I told him what I wanted to do with the glove, he consented to let me take it. But every now and then he still asked me, you still got my glove, don't you? So see, I love the glove tonight. But it's not because of the glove. Oh, this glove, it's just, a, it's just a cheap little glove. It's got holes in it. If you were to see it sitting around after the service, you'd pick it up and throw it away because, you see, you don't know him. You don't love him. But, you see, I know the one that loves the glove. I know him personally. And he has a special place in my heart. And I love him with all that's within me. So you see, I love the glove tonight, not because of the glove, but I love the one that loves the glove. I tell you, this week you might not have the burden that you should have. I might not have the burden that I should have to reach the world with the gospel. Can I tell you what will fix that? Fall in love with Jesus. Remember, repent, repeat. And I assure you, if you fall in love with Him, you'll have no problem loving them. You've listened so well. Would you bow your head with me tonight? Oh, Lord Jesus, I'm not a smart fellow this evening, but 
I do know this. I preached what you wanted me to preach tonight. Lord, if we're ever going to have a greater burden to the point that it causes us to exercise our faith more than we have in the past, we're going to have to fall in love with you. So maybe tonight some of us here need to remember repent and start repeating our first works because Lord if we're ever going to love the 7 billion plus people of the world Lord it's going to start by falling head over heels in love with you again oh God wilt thou not revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee We'll give you